happening, isn't it? Let's get this out of the way. Baron Hemel is not the weirdest double feature out there. That distinction belongs and will always to Studio Ghibli's actual double feature release of My Neighbor Totoro and Grave of the Fireflies. The actual interesting thing about Baron Hemel is that after a long, 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 long time, the popular thing be allowed in the same paddock with the high art thing. Moreover, with Barbara Hammer, not only the popular thing is allowed next to the high art thing, but the fact both shared spaces is widely celebrated. So will Barbara Hammer end this false dichotomy, this segregation of pop art and high art? No, it won't. Well, my work is done here. With luck and a few other examples like Barbara Hammer in the next few years, the separation will be smaller, that's all. The inverse proportionality between artistic value and popularity has been always a thing, but it arguably peaked with the backlash Titanic got after its massive success. So much so that the Academy eventually had to expand the Best Picture category back out to 10 nominations because could we please get some popular stuff nominated again? Please. And even nowadays, we see the ripples of this in stupid ideas like cinematic and box office achievement. So, even if it probably won't solve the issue, I'm crossing my fingers for the arrival of more Barbenheimers. Things with mass appeal tend to be the popular ones. Duh. But do they really? Because what's mass appeal? there will always be things that more people like and things not so many people like. Sometimes things pretty much nobody likes. But what is what changes and always will. Tastes in storytelling, in art, are fluid and weird too. Sometimes something is so unappealing that taste turns itself inside out and suddenly this awful thing has a broader and more enduring appeal than many average and even decent things. Taste is not what we think it is. It certainly doesn't work like it's taught. The flawed assumption here that permeates all branches of storytelling, entertainment, content creation <laughs> is that there is such a thing as a coherent, cohesive, immutable underlying structure behind all things with mass appeal, one that you can harness. Well, when I say you, I mean studios, publishers, streamers. One that those can harness, supposedly to better service the public, but actually in order to mold all forms of artistic expression into content mill shit, where mindless and above all, wageless drones could produce popular content that makes a decent profit no matter what. The assumption is simply not true. There is no magic formula hidden under every and all storytelling success, much less behind a carefully cherry-picked collection of stories across the ages. But if you can't convince the people with the money there is one, something relatively easy because through history most people with money, I mean real money, have had no idea of how storytelling works, if you can't convince these rich idiots, they'll give you money. So you get to make your maybe good, maybe bad, probably mess story based on an imaginary set of selling points. The result? Most things get made based on imaginary sets of selling points. This way, statistically, most good, bad and mess stuff is a result of those ethereal selling points. Then everybody in the business focuses as much as possible in the monetary successful stories, not the good stories, mind you. And the people with the money gives more and more money to those vapid structures, less to the others, creating this nice self-fulfilling prophecy fueled by gatekeeping and ads. A lot of ads. Supported by all of this, of course, the fashionable trick of the day achieves more success than all the others. How could it not? Intermediaries and hacks do this for as long as possible because their livelihoods depend on it. Even when it's clear the hip formula runs out of steam no matter how much money you dump into it. Finally, they leave it behind. But they would never admit all storytelling formulas and structures are by themselves basically equal at guaranteeing success. This cyclic process of formula seeking has been happening in movies, publishing, TV, comics, paintings, culture, you name it, for as long as such a thing as a market for art has existed, and will always keep happening despite a child could see. Trends are a thing, society and tastes change, evolve, pivot, always have, and there is no such a thing as a magic formula for anything. 
Now that I got the rant out of the way, let's start with Titanic. If there is someone who has had success in making popular stuff, that's James Cameron. You may say, by catering to the masses, and you'll be not wrong, but also not right either. James Cameron is a genius at balancing huge spectacle and popular appeal. People say he's also other things. When it comes to torture, I trust the lady who spent three years married to James Cameron. <laughs> like his style or not, he's a massively talented guy. Popular stuff has an artistic value. In his own words, LA Times critic Kenneth Turin mistakes archetypes for cliché. I don't share his view that the best scripts are only the ones that explore the perimeter of human experience or flashily pirouette their witty and cynical dialogue for our admiration. Titanic is probably the zenith of this talent of his. I could spend months searching the internet for memes to illustrate what indie movie culture meant in the 2010s, and I'd still fall short before two simple words. Frances Ha. Everything Greta Gerwig did before and after speaks the same language. Even when she jumped into bigger things, her style was there. And Barbie is as indie a movie as a mega hit with a budget of 145 million can be, but it's not an indie movie. Christopher Nolan reminds me of Finnish Formula 1 driver Kimi Raikkonen. Precise, relentless, but sudden cold, a German was the people's champion in comparison. In Nolan's case, he makes David Fincher feel warm in comparison. I even use the gender natural monarch because not only his films are cold, they are ambivalent to sex. His sex scenes are the absolute opposite of porn. They are equally clinical and arouse no emotion whatsoever. I wonder if Nolan started this current sexless cinematic landscape of the later 2010s and early 2020s, but certainly he fits on it. The guy is a damn master of his craft, anyway. And our collective ears and brains pray in silence that Oppenheimer is a good indicator of Nolan getting out of his I like it when my audience can't possibly understand one third of the dialogue and half of the action phase. We kind of hate teenage girls. More broadly, we hate girly chick stuff. Take out the mushy love story, which is not so mushy really, I'll get to that later, but get rid of the love story, or give it less importance, and there wouldn't have been any backlash. Not for the movie being so expensive, seems a joke in the current movie budget ecosystem, not for Cameron's nerdiness about underwater exploration, not for the movie sweeping the Oscars, not even for the director's cringy celebration. <laughs> Titanic is functionally two movies. But the action in second half hinges on the first, a romance, sorry. And another imaginary set of rules about what's good or not good, popular or not popular, or any combination of those, is this. Romance stories can't be actually really, really good. Can't they? Lovely. Let's see if Warren Hammer helps us to allow ourselves to enjoy things beyond these limiting perceptions. I'm tempted to just leave the meme here, in silence, for 5 minutes, nothing more. Because trying to give a complete explanation of the Barbenheimer phenomenon is, at the end of the day, pretend that the meme and Barbenheimer itself need to be explained. Celebrating the phenomenon? Begging Hollywood to stop pretending the broader appeal is the only approach to the movie business? Marvelous, going into ultra-rational, data-driven rabbit holes about how the two movies fed into each other or whatever? Well, my channel is called Overthinking Things. Chi sono io per giudicarla? But seriously, are we going to pretend to be surprised at people liking different things? Among my favorite movies are Silence of the Lambs and Wall-E, Breaking for a Dream and Back to the Future. The Witch and The Matrix, The Life of Brian and Dancer in the Dark. Who is surprised by this? Well, I've been called weird once or twice. People have been liking different kinds of movies, TV shows and books for ages, but mainstream society, focus groups and marketing create these imaginary boxes to make it easy to sell you stuff, and suddenly we all pretend that because there is a 65-35 split between moviegoers to so-called chick flicks and action movies, or to somber ponderous biopics, only girls like chick flicks and only men like somber ponderous biopics. Even with a 75-25 split, do you know how much is 25 of the box office of any of these movies? 25 is not nothing. 75 is not everything. Do you know how I know that? 
ask the money people behind these movies to give up these 25%. After all, it's nothing. Now ask movies that barely make a profit to do the same streamlining. That 25 is even less now, isn't it? What could possibly be the problem? Barrel Hammer is not surprising at all, but for the fact that every release schedule, every marketing strategy has been trying to accentuate its divide between popular and lighthearted and artsy and serious to make it easier to market stories. You have type A for type A people, type B for type B people. Look, is it a boy movie or a girl movie? We have to choose. And then big tent pole events to appeal to everybody. Baron Hammer is how things should be, and would be if bullshit marketing strategies didn't skew public perception. Yeah, sometimes you only want to binge watch The Office or Parks and Rec for the nth time, but if the stories are well made, exciting, carefully crafted, and not just regurgitated content, as it happens, variety is a huge selling point and always has been. I never had special aversion nor appreciation either for romance movies, but for most of my life I've hoarded this bent resentment towards Titanic because of what happened in the Oscars in 1998. You see, 1998 was the first year in my life I watched the Oscars after having watched all the best picture nominees. Titanic, as good as it gets, The Full Monty, Good Will Hunting, LA Confidential. And I experienced for the first time this maddening rage when an award ceremony gives away the prize to the least deserving movie, at least in my opinion at the time. My beef wasn't exactly against the romance. It was against this generic as f movie that needs no boost whatsoever to make money, taking the place of any of those stories that spoke to me way more. Apparently, in my late teens, I felt like a long term unemployed steel worker from Sheffield. Then I grew up. And the Oscar goes to Green Book. Dances with Wolves. Shakespeare in Love. Crash. The King's Speech. Then I watched Lindsay Ellis's essay on Titanic and realized my fury was a form of bigotry against the mainstream. I still maintain that 1998 was one of the strongest ones in the best picture category because other than cinematic and box office achievement, any of the other four movies deserve the award as much as Titanic. But its win doesn't bother me anymore because I got over myself and I no longer hold the delusion of belief that popular appeal or popular success equals lesser quality. Titanic is functionally two movies. There is the love story and there is the action flick, a miniature Barbenheimer. I watched the movie for the first time in years for this video. And you know what? It's a really good movie, well told, masterfully directed, every shot has significance, and the movie does something most movies are not allowed to do anymore, particularly big tentpole spectacle ones. It lets the story breathe. The dolphin scene, does it propel the plot? It helps establish the setting, characterizes Jack and other characters, the mounting excitement helps us invest in the ship and what it represents for later when it, spoiler alert, sinks, but above all sets up the contrast between Jack doing this, Rose doing this, and both doing this. But propelled as such, it doesn't, and the sequence lasts a whopping 2 minutes 40 seconds. Almost three minutes in which, action-wise or in terms of shifting from one narrative bit to the next, nothing happens. Breathe. Then there is the love story. You see, the first time I saw the movie I had this tired impression, you know which one, that impression that I've seen this before. Pointless debates about whether originality is dead aside, I think we all have been having this impression in the last 25 years or so that We've been served the same ideas, plots, character archetypes, etc., recycled in the most safest and therefore inherently repetitive way possible. I think we all can enjoy the same story told over and over when it brings something new to the table, when it's a mashup made with care and love, or even when it's basically the same but the underlying idea is compelling, but to a damn point. When media is more ubiquitous than ever, when memes are instantaneous, when everything is connected and ideas are more recycled than ever because companies are more risk averse than ever, in that environment of inherent visible repetition, we the consumers are more and more aware than ever of that. Not again! 
And it's not that I don't understand the comfort of enjoying the same thing over and over. I read Lolita five times, watched Silence of the Lambs at least 20, Bings watched Castle House, Buffy the Vampire Slayer about four times each, but original the story of Titanic isn't. At the same time, it is way less mushy than you think it is. I'd say not mushy at all, really. For a supposedly wholesome, family-friendly, tentpole blockbuster in the late 90s, the movie is even sexually subversive. How, do you ask? The drawing scene is profoundly erotic. The sex scene is not mushy, goes a bit overboard with Jack shaking and has a strategically placed blanket, of course, after this. But captures quite well the mundane enthusiasm of a couple of mad and love teenagers doing it for the first time. There is no narrative punishment applied to Rose for her sexual escapade, and the movie goes to great lengths to say, you see this old wrinkly wise lady? She is the same person, the same young rebellious girl that hung out and partied with scoundrels, danced inappropriately, drank, smoked, and just had fun, joyous, and guilty sex. And thinking of Rose, the girl decided for herself to do what she did. It's not up to you to save me, Jack. And what she did was say goodbye to her fiancé by greeting him with reverse revenge porn before, way before the internet was a thing. Here you have me. Just hours ago, I was lying here butt naked, being painted by a low life wearing your damn stone. Next, she f***ed the guy she left her fiancé for in the very same car he brought her to the ship. And also... I'd rather be his whore than your wife. And... She's savage. Just to be clear, the guy deserved all of that and then some. You'd think Titanic would be up there with all the movies that over the allies, romance and sex, but... It was the most erotic moment of my life. Up until then, at least. So, she's not referring only to this. Oh, lady got around, if you know what I mean. And good for her. And don't forget that the one doing a lot of the saving in the action part of the movie is Rose, and in a realistic way too. So, like it, don't like it, but Titanic is not your average melodramatic mush. Let's set aside the fact that Barbie sums up the thesis of this essay the divide between important stories and popular stories is bullshit in the 1 minute and 45 seconds of its first sequence. I had this theory about the way so-called woke movies and TV shows have been getting criticism lately more for being woke than for the many objective flaws that have nothing to do with diversity of feminism. They were, I mused, too unsubtle with their themes. Politics aside, no one ever liked a movie that beats you over the head with its message, any message. Then I listened to this speech. It is literally impossible to be a woman. And you have to say you want to be healthy, but also you have to be thin. Also, everything is your fault. And then I saw the overwhelming support for the movie. So, okay, I guess I'm an idiot. Barbie works, despite its many, many moving parts, despite the many, many visible seams of the many, many compromises made for this ultimately cooperative marketing tool of a movie, the story as a whole works. Even the absurdly overt and simplistic speech. I myself consider this much more concise and straight to the point address far superior. Women have told everyone to just f off. <laughs> Tired of being judged for choosing to have children or not have children, to have children and go back to work, to have children and not go back to work, for being too thin, too fat, too pushy, too unambitious, too hot, not hot enough, or even for just daring to be alive, <laughs> women have stressed that everyone can go f themselves. <laughs> But in the context of the movie, the speech and the message across the entire runtime of the movie works. Sorry, not sorry. The best thing about this movie is that Oppenheimer is not portrayed as this brooding, tortured genius everybody is drawn to for no discernible reason other than the script says so. He's confident, charming in his own way, a natural leader, the smartest guy in the room, an asshole a lot of the time, but also capable of being vulnerable, empathetic, kind and supportive, and above all, he's an idiot! 
all the mess with Florence Pugh's character, all the lies to the government, he had no need to dig himself into that grave. He's stupid by his own admission. In other words, human, which is what you need to portray the father of the atomic bomb with real, tangible weight. As a result of that, this Nolan movie doesn't lack emotion. It isn't warm either. And the fact this scene elicits any sexual outcry is a reflection of this sexless neo-puritan movie moment we are immersed in. But being not warm is perfect for the character of Oppenheimer. The scientific topic, the politic drama, the dead series historical approach, it did need emotion. And if a little gimmicky at times, it has emotion. And it works. Bonus points, I actually understood everything without the need for subtitles, 11 rewatches, and a spreadsheet. But Oppenheimer is better than Barbie, I hear. Come on, you have to admit that. Well, Barbie is a corporative product, which primary reason for existence is selling a product. But from time to time, a pretty good movie with that premise shows up. The movie is a mess of we have to have. We have to have a fun setting where we show all the Barbies, poking fun of stereotypes and unfortunate products, but not poking too much fun that the company looks bad, but enough to be, you know, fun. The same with the company itself, even if it makes the movie lose momentum. The same with the real world. We have to have real people living if probably makes more sense to keep the action in Barbieland. It had to be Studio Notes galore, and the fact the movie has a lot of heart in that environment is a testament to Gerwig's creative vision. Oppenheimer is a biopic with much less pressure. The story is settled, so yes, narratively Oppenheimer is way more cohesive, and personally I like it more, but both are essentially equally good at doing what each one wants to do. Also, Barbie is objectively better in production design, costumes, score. Another way in which popular stuff has to supposedly be worse than important stuff, but actually hasn't, is heavy dramatic acting versus light-hearted comedy acting. Sorry, but the acting is pretty much awesome in both movies. And in my humble opinion, what Margot Robbie does here is better than anything Killian Murphy does in Oppenheimer. Because here, with the slightest of voice hesitations, the subtlest of expression twitches, you see and understand Barbie started that sentence saying, you need to be yourself for yourself first, to Ken. But when she's finishing it, she finds out she's saying it to herself too. She realizes she needs that lesson as much as Ken does. And she's surprised and baffled, then processes it, understands the truth of it better than if someone would have said it to her, or even if she had read it 20 times in a self-help book, and finally she accepts that truth in the span of 1.5 seconds. Killian Murphy is an amazing actor, but this is freaking awesome. We did it with the different parts of Baron Hammer. Can't we do the same with both parts of Titanic, romance and action? Can't we collectively reject the idea that popular, like-hearted movies are awful and heavy action-packed ones aren't and just enjoy variety? It's the spice of life. 